Uh, so good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to day two of Open Source Summit. Uh, you are currently in what you should know about etcd v3. My name is Elsie Phillips, and this is my partner in crime, Paul Burt. So let's first address, what is etcd v3? So etcd is a fast, reactive, modern JavaScript framework. I'm totally just kidding. Uh, as you probably know, etcd is central to a lot of what we work on at CoreOS, uh, which is distributed systems. It arose out of the need to reliably coordinate configurations and state in that environment. Um, so etcd is a fully replicated, highly available, and consistent key value store. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with those terms, we're just going to quickly break that down. Fully replicated means that the entire store is available at every location in the network. Highly available means that it's designed to avoid single points of failure and ensure that when hardware and networks fail, that it does not cause interruption or degradation in service for the end user. Uh, now, if you're familiar with the literature, you might contest us calling at CD highly available because of the CAP theorem. But what we mean by highly available is that people can read from it and availability of reads is important for load balancer configurations or service discovery. Finally, consistent means that every read from it returns the most recent write. Um, so how does etcd work? Uh, it's based on the Raft algorithm and is centered around three key concepts, leaders, elections, and terms. So each cluster is a healthy little micro-democracy. It elects a leader for a given term. That leader pushes updates to the followers. If the leader is killed, which would be very tragic, the cluster will elect a new leader and things will carry on as normal. Since its introduction, it has become an integral part of cloud native systems, systems for running Google-like infrastructure. It's part of projects like Kubernetes, where it's the primary data store, Cloud Foundry's Diego, networking solutions like Canal, and many others. So, you know, it's, it's pretty popular. Um, it has a decent number of stars on GitHub, which, as we all know, is like the most important metric for like measuring open source projects. Um, it's used in production by many Global 2000 companies, and uh, many companies also contribute to it. Uh, so just to give you a quick recap of the project, um, it's about two years old. We released the first stable version, etcd 2.0, in early 2015, and last year we uh, rolled out um, etcd v3. So why are we talking about it now? So you may remember, uh, last year our CTO, Brandon Phillips, did a number of talks about etcd. We can see here, uh, at large volumes, etcd2 experienced issues handling large snapshots. To keep scaling and ensure etcd remained the community darling for reliable distributed key value storage, we put in some work. Many of Brandon's showcased our progress. Late in 2016, we completed work on our initial release of etcd3. That increment is a major version number if you're a fan of semantic versioning. The above is a screenshot of Brandon highlighting some of these improvements. More efficient communication, a revamped API, and significantly improved storage performance. So our work paid off. Uh, the time we put into etcd3 helped Kubernetes scale from 1,000 node clusters passing tests to 5,000 nodes clusters. Kubernetes even adopted etcd3 as its default storage option this year. The community responded positively. They loved the work we were doing. Well, some of the community loved the work. Other parts were less than enthusiastic about adopting new APIs and communication protocols. As Michael Hausenbloss, the creator of Kubernetes backup utility, reshifter, puts it, things are generally well documented, but there are some rough edges. So the goal of this talk is to help folks um, where they might have stubbed their toe, so to speak, help them find those rough edges and avoid them. So I'm going to now pass this over to Paul. All righty. Let's break some stuff. So uh, before we dive into the common mistakes uh, most people seem to make upgrading to etcd version 3, uh, I'll just preface this by, uh, well, first let me increase the size on this. And uh, 
most of these are going to be run inside of a Docker container like this. So we go inside, and then we'll start the etcd process. And that little pretzel at the end is basically just telling Bash that I want this background. Um, we'll see a lot of this gobbledygook as we go through this pretty regularly. Um, and now we're free to issue commands to etcd. So uh, this is kind of the context we'll be operating in. Cool. So first question everybody has when they leave their apartment is, where did I leave my keys? And that is the first question most people seem to have when they upgrade to etcd3 as well. So let's take a look at that. Nope. Oh, yeah. OK. So it's a little bit difficult for me to type with the projector behind me here. So I'm going to do this by video just for convenience. Um, so uh, as you can see, we're starting container as we just demonstrated. Huddle is sort of the PI to version three. We're getting an error now. That's that's kind of seems like going in and out. Yeah. Can everybody hear me if I shout? Yeah. Use the mic. Right. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, I'll do my best. Uh, sorry about the sound. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, as you can see, uh, what's happened here is we have, instead of the set method, used the put method to store a key in etcd version 3. Uh, and this is actually something of a convenience. It's uh, a clue to your developers if you've moved over to etcd version 3 of the API uh, that they want to put their data in using this new command. Um, they will get an error if they try and use the old command, um, which is hopefully exactly what you want if you've got this environment variable set correctly. Um, the whoop, Go back to our slides here. The key takeaway uh, is that etcd has two main namespaces. In etcd version 2, you uh, used to be able to curl the endpoints, uh, access things in a restful manner. etcd version 3 still has that. Uh, but etcd version 3, in the, the sake of speed and performance, has adopted gRPC, which is Google's new RPC protocol. It uses protobufs plus HTTP2. A um, lot more efficient, allows us to multiplex. Uh, and that has a different namespace than the old etcd2 namespace. So if you stash your keys in using a curl and you try and pull them out using gRPC, uh, you're going to have headaches. So uh, try and avoid that. gRPC is the new goodness. Cool. And uh, you may have noticed that the API looks like it changed a little bit. So let's explore that. Uh, did it change? doing this dance again. There we go. So this uh, is relatively quick check. Um, we're going to take a look at the etcd API using the help command in the old value. And you can see there's a couple commands here. The set is in there, uh, as we experienced earlier. Uh, and if we execute that same command with the environment variable set to 3, if we scroll up, you can see there's a lot of new commands uh, available in this new etcd client. Um, and this is part of the work that went into etcd3. This is why this is a major version increment. Um, we've moved into a new MVCC style of working uh, with objects in the database, which allows us to do cool things like transactions uh, and a lot of other stuff. Um, and the next talk we're going to kind of dive into uh, what other things you'll stub your toe on using this new API.
And a quick note before we jump to that section, if you actually want to proactively prevent developers from storing things in the old etcd namespace, if you're starting up your etcd process and you just want to completely disable that because you have no need for it anymore, uh, absolutely set the dash dash enable v2 flag to false. Um, that will prevent people from actually even storing anything in there, even if they're uh, invoking the correct commands. Uh, this is, I don't know, the equivalent of if you enjoy static type checking in your programming languages, keep people honest. Uh, this kind of keeps people honest when they're using your etcd cluster. Cool. Uh, next thing we'll dive into is that the world is now flat. Uh, etcd version 2 used to be hierarchical. That meant uh, you could have kind of a a tree structure with leafs and nodes, uh, and it branched out, and there was a handy command that you could use to kind of collect everything that rested underneath of a node. Um, let's take a look at that and see how the new commands work for accessing data. Cool. So uh, we are firing up our uh, command line here, and we're going to set some values in the old structure, uh, this branch node. So cartoon slash rm stands for Rick and Morty. We'll add another cartoon into the directory just to give it some companionship. So we'll set the uh, Venture Brothers here. And uh, we'll go ahead and retrieve those keys in the old etcd2 style. So the ls command uh, will actually reveal everything that's on your current uh, level. And if we go one deeper and we look, we ls the cartoons directory the same way it works in uh, your bash command prompt, you'll see all of the values that are in there. But when we switch our API to version 3, uh, as you can see, uh, we run into problems because of that new flattened key space. So uh, we have a solution. Um, one thing to note before we move on to that solution is that the, this directory type structure is gone, um, but you can emulate it in the new flat uh, key space uh, if you so desire. And uh, after thinking about these usage patterns, it became apparent to the team that the hierarchical structure with uh, all the stuff that comes along with it uh, was less efficient than this flat key space. The flat key space reduced overhead, increased efficiency of our queries, um, and it just makes search a lot easier. So uh, let's take a look at that. And uh, to do that, we're going to take a look using querying based on prefixes and ranges. Alrighty, so uh, we are gonna set some keys again uh, as we fire up this demo. Um, we want some keys that are somewhat related to each other, so we're gonna choose the Star Wars uh, trench run scene and uh, grab some quotes from that. So we've got red one reporting in, uh, red two standing by, and uh, finally let's add something for red leader. Uh, let's lock our S foils into attack position. Cool, so we've got our keys, uh, and now it's time to query them. Um, let's do a range first. So we'll do a search for uh, red one to red three, and uh, that has returned values for us. So uh, this is inclusive at the front. That means the first value red is included in the query, but exclusive at the end. That means red three is excluded. So if we had set this as red two in our query, um, we would be excluding data that we want. This is pretty normal, um, but sometimes it can catch you off guard. It's what a lot of people call like a half open interval. And uh, you know, you may notice that we're actually missing red leader here, and he's a pretty important part of the squad. So their key namespace here in another way by searching for a certain prefix. Uh, so now we're getting the entire uh, red squadron by searching for the prefix red, um, and that's exactly what we want. Uh, so ranges and prefixes are super cool. Highly recommend using them. Um, this is the replacement for ls. And uh, another cool feature, kind of 
enabled by this new move to the transactional key space is we can actually track history for keys that get entered into etcd. So this is really handy for debugging things or even just looking into your programs and seeing how a key evolves over time, tracking behavior. Uh, so let's take a look at that. So uh, once again, we'll need to set up our cluster. Uh, what we're going to do here is uh, make it so that the, that one key gets changed a number of times. So we're going to meme it up and use silly pet names. So Doge is first, Snake is second, Burb is third. Uh, we've got our keys that are all under the changed key. Uh, and we can see that Burb is our last changed. And now when we add this rev flag, uh, we're actually searching over the revisions. So we're getting some initialization here. Uh, nothing is actually happening. Uh, and as we go through those revisions, we'll start to see values. So we'll see uh, it was doge first, it was snake second, and it was burb uh, last. So uh, if we were to actually continue to query uh, like this outside of the uh, namespace, um, we would start to get an error from etcd saying, you've actually reached the end of this list. Uh, you don't need to go any further. So uh, I personally am a big fan of that when it comes to just seeing what's happening. Uh, that can be hard to track. Cool. So uh, use the rev flag. Uh, really handy. I highly recommend it. Definitely one of the coolest things uh, I like about etcd in the new uh, process. So uh, there are actually a number of other handy methods that we don't have time to go into here. Um, but if you are interested, we have a very nice documentation on this. And you can see some of the stuff that we've shared with you here is documented on CoreOS's website. So uh, definitely uh, check it out. Follow one of the interaction guides like this one. Um, and it'll get you kind of in the right mindset for working with etcd. OK, so the next stumbling block that we see people encounter is selecting the optimal cluster size. An etcd cluster needs a majority of nodes, or a quorum, to agree on updates to the cluster state. A cluster is operational as long as this quorum is intact. In the event of a loss of quorum, like if there was a network partition um, or different types of hardware or network failure, etcd will automatically and safely resume after the network recovers and quorum is restored. Because etcd is an implementation of the raft algorithm, consistency is maintained. We recommend an odd number of members in a cluster because this increases the cluster's fault tolerance, which means that the cluster can survive the same number of failures as an even-sized cluster, but with fewer nodes. The difference can be seen by comparing even and odd-sized clusters, as you can see on this handy-dandy little chart that we made. Uh, for any odd-sized cluster, adding one node will always increase the number of nodes necessary for a quorum. Although adding a node to an odd-sized cluster appears better since there are more machines, the fault tolerance is actually worse since ex the exact same number of nodes may fail without losing quorum. But there are mo more nodes that can fail. If the cluster is in a state where it can't tolerate any more failures, adding a node before removing nodes is actually dangerous because if the new node fails to register with the cluster, quorum will be permanently lost. So you might be looking at this saying, hey, so I should make a nine node etcd cluster for maximum reliability. Um, and I would tell you to hold up a second. Uh, because you should keep in mind that there are more no the more nodes there are in a cluster, the longer it will take for that data to sync. Uh, more nodes has a speed trade-off. Cool. So that begs the question, uh, what the heck happens if I lose my quorum in my cluster? Uh, and the answer is, you're dead. Um, your cluster can't do anything. So uh, we need to recover from this somehow. So let's, uh, this isn't anything new necessarily to etcd3, but this is still a good topic to cover, uh, just because it's so central to kind of distributed systems in general. Cool. So uh, we're going to set up our cluster again, uh, enter a key, I think that is just hello world. 
Um, and then we're going to make use of a new command in etcd version 3 called the snapshot command. Now you may remember from etcd version 2, uh, some of our documentation recommended actually just wholesale copying the data directory that your data was in. Um, you can still do that in etcd version 3, but hopefully through this presentation try and convince you that the snapshot command is uh, slightly more convenient. So you can see here, uh, we've entered some values. We are now saving our database to root slash snap. Um, we are now going to viciously kill our etcd process. And uh, now we're off to the races. We, we need to take a look at where the old etcd data is, which is in this default etcd uh, up in the upper left. Sorry, that blue on black's a little hard to read. Uh, and uh, we can see where our snap data is. It's under our root as we had saved it before. Uh, so what we want to do first, etcd is not running at all at this point. Uh, we just want to restore the snapshot to a location. So um, we're going to specify that location with the data dir, and we'll just name that new dir. And it looks like that succeeded. Uh, our snapshot has successfully been created, and we have this new directory in our root uh, where our snapshot has been restored to. And now when, it, when we launch our cluster, we're going to use that same command, data dir equals new dir, uh, pretzel it to get it to run in and uh, hopefully we can query it here and confirm that our data from our previous cluster is now in this new cluster, which is exactly what happened. So uh, this is very simple. Uh, one thing that's really nice about the snapshot is when you take a snapshot uh, from etcd uh, it, using the version 3 API, it's actually uh, saving a cryptographic hash. So if your data has been corrupted in transit uh, or something has happened to it otherwise, uh, etcd will check that and warn you about it before it actually does the restore. Um, so that's pretty handy. Great. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that again in a second, uh, snapshots and restoring things. Uh, but just a quick detour into uh, knowing your limits, which is always good in software. It's, I think, good personally, too. Um, but some Silicon Valley stuff tells me it's not. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there's a limit of one megabyte uh, per request. And by default, there's a two gigabyte storage limit on etcd. etcd can scale up to eight gigabyte storage. Uh, but that's configurable by a flag. Uh, so you might be thinking, this is a little weird. Uh, what's going on here? Um, and on coreos.com, we have a page that uh, sort of explains this. Uh, you know, the things that you would want to compare etcd to uh, are in this handy comparison chart. So uh, there's etcd, zookeeper, console, and new SQL databases like CockroachDB or Spanner. Um, if you're looking to store things that are in the terabyte sort of size or the multi-gigabyte size, uh, you may be searching for something more like Spanner or CockroachDB. Um, if you are actually looking to store configuration data, state data, pass messages around, um, etcd is wonderful. Uh, if you are looking for service discovery or something along those lines, a console uh, works very well. It ha has a lot more developer experience sort of niceties, uh, but it tends to fall down when you get beyond you know, several hundred megabytes uh, in its storage. So etcd scales a lot further, um, and we see Zookeeper as our real kind of the target that we want to hit. And to that point, um, we've even released an adapter, a wrapper that sits on top of etcd and can take commands from the Zookeeper a uh, API, uh, and etcd can act in place of Zookeeper in your cluster. So we have some folks running etcd in place of Zookeeper on an Apache Kafka setup. Um, we've seen a lot of good performance benefits from that. You can check it out on our blog if you're interested in reading about all the fun statistics around that. Hmm? Oh, yeah, sorry. It's, it, the, the wrapper is called ZCD, if you're interested. It's etcd with a Z at the front. Cool. Uh, so, oh, I think I skipped a slide, yeah. Uh, so, uh, does etcd uh, do Byzantine fault tolerance? And the quick answer is no. Um, 
So uh, some of you may be scratching your head saying, what is Byzantine fault tolerance itself? So uh, what that is is when something crashes, it doesn't completely crash. It crashes in a partial way. Uh, so your health check might report that the node is working perfectly well, but the node is actually spewing garbage into your cluster. Um, this is sometimes called like the Byzantine generals problem, um, and it's well known in the distributed system space. Uh, so, quoting from Wikipedia, uh, Byzantine failures imply no restrictions, which means that the failed node can generate arbitrary data, uh, pretending to be a correct one, uh, and it makes fault tolerance difficult. Uh, so what does that mean for etcd? Uh, well, it, it's the same thing that it means for any other raft protocol algorithm. Uh, this is something that just raft doesn't cover in general, and etcd kind of being uh, one of the more well-known Raft implementations out there uh, is no different. We, we don't do anything fancy to dance around that. that. That is all to say, if you introduce garbage into your cluster, uh, etcd may not know what to do if it uh, is not information that's supposed to be there. Cool. Uh, what else is important? Well, one thing is upgrading from uh, version 2 to version 3. Uh, but before we jump into that, uh, you should know that there are other cool tricks you can do. Like there's a multi-key conditional transaction. Um, this means like your data will all get written at the same time, guaranteed. Uh, you should definitely do this instead of just comparing and swapping values. Uh, you know, comparing and swapping values is easy, but uh, if something goes wrong midway through that, uh, you might be up a creek without a paddle. Um, and uh, it's also important to note that. Uh, we had TTLs, time to live, on certain keys in etcd. You could specify that as a flag in version 2. Um, in version 3, there is a new lease object uh, which the TTL attaches to. So it's just a quick switch in the semantics there. Um, cool. So uh, what does it look like when you upgrade from 2 to 3? Uh, this happened recently when Kubernetes 1.6 adopted etcd3 as its kind of main data store. Uh, and it's actually a relatively simple process. So uh, etcd version 2 and version 3, we've thoroughly tested the upgrade from 2.3 to 3.0. So that's the upgrade path you'll likely take. Uh, what you'll do is you'll say you have a three node cluster. Uh, you'll stop one of the 2.3 processes and then just drop in the 3.0 process in its place. And these two versions can actually intermingle. So the, three, the new 3.0 process will sync, gather the data. You'll stop one of the other 2.3 processes, drop in a 3.0 process, rinse and repeat until your entire cluster is now running etcd version 3.0. Um, you'll find a convenience command on etcd 3.0 to migrate your old version 2 keys to the new 3.0 namespace if you desire that, if uh, you want to take advantage of all the cool new performance stuff. Um, but if not, um, you can keep running uh, the old v2 namespace on the new uh, well-tested etcd 3.0 platform. Another thing that's worth checking out, uh, since you're all here and uh, interested in watching etcd uh, kind of get kicked around, uh, I like it. I think this is the funnest part of distributed systems. Uh, talked at in 2016, and uh, his talk focused on running containers at scale. So uh, he suggested fire drills are a really good way to test your knowledge of running the cluster. Basically, the most important things you need to know about distributed systems are the failure states. All of the theory that's around distributed systems is essentially how can it go wrong. Um, so you should have some good working knowledge of how things fail in etcd as well. Uh, so I think this is a great guide. Unfortunately, uh, our CTO's talk was more focused on Kubernetes than at CD. Uh, so that begs the question, uh, what should we use then to do our fire drill? And uh, thankfully, CoreOS ascribes to the, the googly SRE kind of philosophy of codifying um, all of your procedures in uh, actual code. Uh, so you can actually check out the etcd operator, which is our version of that. And let me... Zoom this in a little bit. Scroll down on the README. So you can see uh, there's an overview and then a quick demo. Uh, basically, just shows you how to get the cluster created uh, on Kubernetes. Uh, that's what the etcd operator is. It leverages part of Kubernetes reconciliation loop to um, make things easy. 
there's all these drills laid out for how to resize a cluster or uh, recover from fail failure modes, um, that sort of thing. So uh, this is your fire drill template if you want to follow along with that. Uh, great, so I was going to do a demo of the etcd operator in action. Um, unfortunately, I had problems with hotel Wi-Fi, so let's see if that resolved itself during the talk. I had this all kind of, oh boy, which one of these is my actual terminal? That's the question. Well, should be able to quit quick time. There we go. Uh, cool. Nope, and our cluster is actually still booting. Uh, got stunted by the hotel Wi-Fi. Uh, cool, so in any event, uh, what I was gonna suggest is if you are not on hotel Wi-Fi, if you're at home on your own connection, uh, we have the etcd sandbox, which lets you download a Kubernetes cluster, boot it up using Vagrant, uh, and we eat our own dog food here. So, uh, you know, the, the etcd operator is actually at the heart of this Kubernetes cluster. So what you can do is open up the Tectonic console, uh, visit the deployment for the etcd operator, kick over a node, just delete it, and watch the operator automatically recover from that failure without you doing anything. It'll automatically reconcile that it needs three nodes and fix that for you without you intervening at all. Okay, so as Paul said, uh, we invite you to try out the etcd operator and the tectonic sandbox. Uh, if you're interested in the tectonic sandbox, that is where you can find it, and that's where you can find us. That might be Paul, Elsie Philly. Um, and if you would like a copy of these slides, that's where you can find them. Uh, and now we'll open it up for any questions people might have. Thank you. Uh, that is an excellent question. I am unsure. It seems that uh, an initialization kind of blank spot gets saved at the front for every revision. So uh, it's definitely the sort of thing that you'd want to tumble through programmatically as opposed to uh, doing it introspectively kind of through the command line. Uh, not as far as I'm aware. That's a great question, though. Uh, I'll ask the etcd team. Someone on there might know. Uh, and if I find something, I'll tweet about it. Uh, yeah, I think you would just have to write a loop, unfortunately, uh, as ugly as bash scripting is. Um, uh, again, I'll check with the team. That sounds like a great feature request if we don't already have it. So, cool. Uh, Yeah, that's absolutely correct. So in the old versioning scheme, um, like Kubernetes, for instance, would create a resources slash uh, member slash whatever thing it was controlling. Um, those slashes would just kind of disappear, and you'd have those that kind of prefix name up front. So it, it works the same way in practice when you're storing a key inside of etcd. Um, you're just not using slashes to delimit uh, different folders. Uh, and then when you query it, uh, you kind of get exactly what you're looking for in that space. Uh, that concept is completely gone. So it's a flat key space for performance reasons. 
uh, we just saw a huge benefit to switching to that model, and that, that's also part of the MVCC transition. It enabled a lot of these other architectural changes. Um, and I think a lot of that was at the request of uh, a lot of the projects that Etcity supports. Uh, we support a lot of Global 2000 companies that are very, very large scale. Um, and Kubernetes in particular drove a lot of the API changes. Yes, you can still include slash uh, if you would like to include that in your keys. Uh, so the entire request can be one megabyte. Uh, so if your key takes up <laughs> like, you know, all of that, uh, you're kind of SOL, SOL in terms of storing your value. But uh, yeah, that, that's kind of the, the terms. Cool. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Cheers.